Where are we today, Phil? Saltash. And what's the significance of Saltash in the Civil War? Saltash was one of those places that changed hands over and over again. Eight times during the Civil War it changed hands. Started off uh, when the, the Civil War at the beginning, 1642, um, the Royal, the Roundhead, the Parliamentarians in East Cornwall um, tried to take control of the county for Parliament, but were ousted. So the small roundhead garrison that was here in the early part of the Civil War withdrew, no problem at all. In January 1643, when Colonel Ruthven invaded Cornwall to take on Lord H uh, Sir Rolf Hopton's army gathering down in around Los Withiel, um, Saltash became roundhead again. A parliamentarian garrison was established here, a small force. After Braddock, Braddock Down, which was Ruthven's big defeat, Hopton met him at the Battle of Braddock Down, or near Braddock Down, on January the 19th, and defeated him. Ruthven's army shattered, disintegrated. Uh, he fled to Saltash with about 500 survivors, um, fortified the town up the top of Fourth Street at the hill, which is um, doesn't go as far as it did in those days. That's quite a big hill, isn't it? It's quite a steep hill. He put an earthwork fort there, put his men in the fort. The Royalists attacked, threw him out after fierce fighting, cons compared to what happened at Braddock Down where the Roundheads uh, just disintegrated. Here, they put up a stout defense for it until their ammunition ran low. And then they were forced to flee and they came running down this hill to their boats at the bottom. It was said that one of the boats capsized and some of the men were drowned. Ruthven made it back to Plymouth, but it was all over for him. Later on, it changed hands again. Uh, it was um, bombarded several times. When the Earl of Essex came in, uh, into Devon in 1644 for his invasion of Cornwall, Saltash was again evacuated. Um, this time, a garrison was placed here under a man called Colonel Anthony Rouse from Plymouth. Uh, Plymouth, he was a Cornishman, but the garrison was from Plymouth. When Essex was defeated and his army captured, during the battles around Los Withiel in September 1643, uh, 1644, sorry. Um, he, he came back to Plymouth by boat, but his army surrendered. The Royalists moved up here, part of the army came down. Uh, so Colonel Rouse realized he couldn't hold Saltash with what he had, so withdrew back to Plymouth, fell into the, round, the Royalist hands again. And in, in 1644, shortly after King Charles abandoned his siege of Plymouth after Saltash was, with, was evacuated. The Royalist army moved to Plymouth, tried to besiege the town. After a week, they left. Saltash uh, was attacked in October the 5th, 1644, by Lord Robarts. He sent a force over here. For some reason, <laughs> no other reason than vanity, really, I suppose, because he was part of the reason that the, Royal, the Earl of Essex marched into Cornwall. So he sent a force over, occupied Saltash. Sir Richard Grenville, the new Royalist commander north of Plymouth, decided to get rid of them quickly. So the next evening, he sent a force, a strong force, over the road, over to attack the fort, the fort here. How would they get over here from Plymouth, do you think? They could have used boats there, but otherwise they would have had to march all the way up to Gunners Lake, and that way they didn't have time. So I think there were Royalists in Cornwall, there were Royalist garrisons around. So I think Grenville sent boatloads across. That's the only way really to get there that quick because he attacked the next evening. Uh, it would have been too long to go all the way around so unless they marched all night. So the boats would have come perhaps from what we call road. today Sutton Harbour, across the Hoe, around Western Kings, up the river to here? Yes, more than likely because it's uh, otherwise you, you, they'll see you coming. Because if they'd come from across the way, they'd be seen, wouldn't they? Yes. So they had to come from yeah, out of sight. That's the Royalists were going to come that yes, way. The, yes, the Royalists would have gone further up river. Right. Where it's, it gets much narrower up there. Um, they attacked the garrison here for three days they held out. Um, they broke in sideways. They attacked north and south. And in the end, they broke in through some side roads. Um, the garrison started to fall apart. The, the Roundheads fled down here. 300 were captured. Some survivors get across the river, made it across the river in boats back to the other side. And that was the end of the war for Saltash, really. It, nothing more happened after that. What but happened to those 300 who were captured? Sir Richard Grenville, well, I think he was angry that 
they defied him for so long, for three days, that he was he threatened to hang them all. All 300 of the prisoners were going to be hanged. And the story goes that Prince Rupert learned about it. How he learned about it so quick, I don't know. And King Charles sent an order not to execute these men. And so they were marched off to prison. That could be just a rumor because it would have taken a long time for this news to get to the king or Prince Rupert, who were miles away by then. And Grenville was not the type of man to hang around. He would, if he wanted to hang these people, he would have done it right away. So I think that's just a, a bit of propaganda put in. So we're standing on here where there'd been an absolute. It would have been a, after the fort, after the fort fell up there. These survivors who didn't surrender because the royalists came in behind them. It said they came in through byways, some right. little lanes that lead in. So they were surprised. A route then. A route. Route. They were routed. Some managed to break through, but this was a muddy street here because when it rained. In the old days, when Saltash was a, a thriving little town in the old days, um, a lot of rich merchants lived here. A thousand people lived in the parish of Saltash and St. Stephen's, and there was about a hundred households here. And they said whenever it rained, it washed the streets clean because there was no sewerage or anything. Yes, of so course. Chucked out. So if you can imagine these men running down here with the mud and everything else and falling over themselves to get away. And we're in the way. <laughs> they're running through us. Yeah, they're running past everything. It's quite a thought, it's isn't quite it? It's a steep hill. Yeah, it's quite a thought to think we're standing here and they're actually running through us yeah. in time. Yeah. So if we could go back in time to that date in this position, see, we'd probably... You'd see panic. Yes. You'd see panic. In your, uh, you just said uh, something about Lord Robarts. I think John you Robarts. mentioned him before, didn't you? Yes, yeah, so he was another. The, he was one of the few Cornish royalists. Uh, Cornishman to fight for Parliament. He was um, governor of Plymouth after Charles I left the siege of Plymouth in September 1644. He was he lost his position uh, because he had to take up his position as an MP after the self-denying ordinance, which was quite interesting really because he wasn't an able commander. People loved him. What is the self-denying ordinance? It's when you, because Parliament were fed up with the way the war was going. A lot of generals were inept. The Earl of Essex just surrounded an army of 7,000 men, six to 7,000 men down here. Um, the other earls, uh, Sir William Waller, he wasn't the best commander. Their commanders were political generals, most of them, favourites. So they decided, Parliament decided it was about time we got a, an army together, train it, officer it with proper officers who are not necessarily wealth, wealthy or in a position of uh, political power, but more for their ability to train and fight. So that's what uh, came in the new model army. So a lot of political generals, if you like, lost their seats, lost their positions in the army, in the military. Once again, Phil, thank you very much. Yeah, very welcome.